Uh, all right, guys. So um, this is uh, going to be, uh, I think, the last lecture that uh, is included in the midterm. So, uh, for introduction, uh, my name is Hadi Sayyid. I'm a second-year medical student. Uh, inshallah, I'll, uh, I'll be giving you this session on the integration of the cardiovascular system. Um, so this session is uh, recorded because uh, there was some sort of a problem in the um, in the scheduling. Uh, so I'm not sure what it was, but say any, either ways, it couldn't be live, but we had to record it. So uh, before we start, I would just like to uh, I would just just like to mention how I organized the slides. So uh, basically, what I did was I took uh, Dr. Simon's slides, and uh, he had the notes at the. Um, at the bottom of each slide. So I simplified those notes into basic points for the slides. And uh, so that inshallah, when you guys read the, the, uh, the original slides, you guys can maybe have a better understanding. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, okay, the first half of this lecture is going to be talking about uh, orthostasis, uh, orthostasis and uh, orthostatic hypotension. But the whole idea behind this is um, basically when you're, when you're lying down, and uh, you stand up, right? So when you stand up, the blood in your body, because of gravity, is going to um, it's going to pool in the lower extremities, okay, or in the lower half of your body. But uh, this uh, can be shown, for example, uh, by a by a water bottle. So uh, this bottle is full, so maybe it's not going to demonstrate this too well. But I think you guys can get the idea. So if you think of this part as the head. And this as the as the lower end of the body or the uh, feet. So when you're lying down, you can see that um, you know the uh, the blood is evenly distributed. But the moment you stand up, you can see that the blood is uh, has pulled towards the lower end, leaving the the upper end uh, empty. So that's the uh, main concept here. I think it's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, this, if we just go through the slide. When you stand, it pulls in the lower extremities. Uh, why? Because of the gravity and the high venous compliance. I think you guys already know that uh, venous veins are called, are the compliance vessels, where they have very uh, high compliance. Uh, so this basically means that uh, they can store a large amount of blood uh, in them. So when the blood goes, they just uh, stretch in order to you know accept that blood. So because there is high venous compliance. Uh, when the blood goes down due to gravity, it's going to stay there because the veins can accommodate uh, that amount of blood. Okay, so this will lead to a reduction in venous return because obviously, when you have uh, you know the blood is staying at the lower ends of the uh, of the body, uh, less blood is going to be coming back up to the heart. When you have reduction in venous return, you're going to have a reduction in cardiac output because obviously, when there is not enough blood coming back into the heart, there won't be enough blood to pump out of the heart. And uh, you're also going to have a mean arterial uh, pressure uh, decrease. So obviously, when cardiac output is uh, uh, decreased, uh, the pressure is also going to be decreased. This is uh, self-explanatory. So this is going to initiate the baroreceptor reflex. So just to think about baroreceptor reflex. This is the uh, main the, the main factor that uh, prevents us from uh, fainting when we stand up after lying down. So if we didn't have the baroreceptor reflex, uh, because of reduction in all of these parameters, including means return, cardiac output, the pressure, you will have decreased blood flow to the brain, uh, which means the brain won't get the oxygen that it needs to function, which is going to lead to fainting. So if we don't have this, uh, the baroreceptor reflex uh, or it's impaired, that would, um, that would cause uh, fainting. Okay, so just uh, this to be noted, I mean, it's gonna be explained further in detail inshallah in the coming slides. Okay, so what does the baroreceptor reflex do essentially? It's going to get the heart rate and contractility and the resistance, and it's gonna increase those. So it's going to, it's going to counteract the, uh, the effect of gravity on, uh, you know, when the blood uh, pulls down, because of gravity, it's gonna counteract that, uh, that problem, uh, which is going to restore all of these things back to normal. Okay, I think it's a pretty simple slide. Uh, sorry. Moving on. So this is essentially the same thing. So, you know, uh, he's telling you in, uh, when you're lying down, this is the arterial pressure and this one is the venous pressure. So when you're lying down or in supine position, um, pressure in the, at the ends of the body, so at the lower end and at the upper end, they're not very different from the heart. So they're somewhat similar, as you can see, any, if the pressure at the heart, arterial pressure at the heart is 100, then uh, any going up or down, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, change that much. Same thing for the venous pressure. Obviously, venous pressure is lower 
than the arterial pressure. So this is two here and uh, five on the sides. But again, as you can see, there is not a great difference between the two. However, uh, the moment you stand up, because of the gravity, the blood is going to uh, is going to you know collect down here at the at the lower end of the body. Uh, so you're going to have decreased um, decreased perfusion of the upper end of the body. Okay, so uh, this basically what what is the um, what is this um, you know or a better way to put it would be in what is the effect what is the effect of this? It's basically um, the pressures in the uh, in the vessels above the heart are going to decrease, and the pressures in the vessel below the heart are going to increase. Again, this is because uh, you have uh, more blood down, so you have increased pressure, and obviously less blood up, so uh, decreased pressure uh, in, in the upper half, okay, or above the heart. So uh, this point here, that blood pressure changes by 0 0.78 millimeter mercury for every centimeter above or below the heart. Uh, so this basically, all, all it's saying is that um, if you go above the heart by, let's say, let's take a hypothetical example. So if you go above the heart by three centimeters, so the pressure, as I mentioned before, it should be lower than the heart, right? But how much lower is it going to be? So it's going to be 0 0.78 for each centimeter. So if it's three, then you have to multiply 0 0.78 by three. And that's going to give you the difference in pressure between the heart and uh, the, the blood vessel that you're at. Okay, this is come on explained uh, uh, more in more detail in the next slides. But uh, the blood blood pressure is measured at the level, level of the heart. So uh, you guys, I think, are going to take this uh, in pro next year. So when you measure blood pressure, you ask the patient to um, put their arm on the table in a way where the uh, where the where the artery is uh, at the same level as the heart. So you're measuring uh, basically uh, the same exact the same at the same exact level. Where the heart is okay so uh yeah uh this is again these are just the notes that he mentioned at the slide so i, I just kind of summarized them so basically essentially same concepts uh, pressure in the vessels of the heart will be reduced below the heart will increase so the veins above the heart uh the pressure there is going to be negative uh why because the the veins have a lower pressure uh already i mean they're at a lower pressure than the arteries so uh, it's two, basically the, the average is two, as mentioned here, uh, at the, at the mean, uh, the right atrial pressure is two. Okay. So obviously when you decrease it more than two, the higher you go, it's going to start getting negative. Okay. That's basically all it says. So this is again, the same uh, concept that you had, they multiply their distance in centimeters, uh, from the heart by 0 0.78, because every single centimeter you have a change of this number. So either a decrease by 0 0.78 for one centimeter or an increase 0 0.78, depending on if you go, if you're going up or down. Okay, so this slide explains this concept in uh, much more detail. So this shows you that, you know, when you raise your arm up above your head, so the radial vein uh, is uh, going to become negative. So, and even if you could see, you know, if you could see your vein somehow, if like your body was transparent, you would see that when you raise your hand above the head, you'd see the blood going down because of the gravity. Okay, if, uh, this will cause the pressure to uh, become negative because you have the, you know, the, the blood is leaving, say, of less volume, less volume, less pressure. So uh, this is all stuff that has been covered in the previous lectures, any of these uh, relationships. Um, so this is, uh, this is the, the concept of the 0 0.78 uh, milligrams mercury in, uh, in change in pressure. So what this is, is basically, this gives you an example of a cr cranial artery in the head. Okay, so the cranial artery is, well, it, he tells you, and he should tell you if he asks a question, is uh, 25 centimeters above the heart, okay? So you're gonna multiply 0 0.78 times 25 because for every single centimeter, you have an increase or a decrease. Well, in this case, it's a decrease, why? Because it's above the heart. So for every single centimeter, you have a decrease of 0 0.78. So you want to see the total, uh, how much the, the total decrease in pressure. So you multiply 0 0.78 by 25 and that, that should give you a 20. So this is, this is not the pressure in the artery. This is the decrease in pressure, okay? So to get to the pressure of the artery, you have to subtract 20 from, 73, uh, from 93. So 93 is the pressure at the level of the heart, okay? So as you go above the heart, the pressure is going to decrease. So by multiplying it by 0 0.78, you find out by exactly how much is the pressure decreasing, and then you subtract it from 93, 
which gives you 73, okay? So this is the same concept in the, of a vein in the foot. So uh, the, the, foot, the vein in the foot is 103 centimeters below the heart, okay? This is again a value that they've given you. So uh, for that, you multiply 0 0.78 by uh, 103 to find out the difference between uh, the vein that you're um, currently calculating the pressure of and the heart. Then you're going to add uh, then you're uh, sorry. Then you're going to uh, add the two, but you're not going to add it to 93 because 93 is the mean arterial pressure. But uh, you're looking at a pressure of a vein, so you're going to have to add it to the right atrial pressure or the pressure of the uh, terminal end of the vena cava, which is uh, they're almost the same. Okay, so you add 80 to the uh, right atrial pressure, which is two, which gives you 82. Again, why are you adding it? Because as you go down, pressure increases. There's an increase in pressure, so you have to add the, uh, the pressure for every centimeter that you go down, okay? So uh, for an artery in the foot, uh, so it's the same thing, 103 centimeters, so you can think that you know, they're, uh, uh, they're at the same level. So 103 centimeters, again, you do the same thing. For every centimeter, you have you multiply by 0.78, so it's 103, you multiply by 0.78 times 103, it's gonna give you 80. This time you add it to 93. Why? Because you're measuring the pressure in the artery. So you're gonna to have to add it to the mean arterial pressure, not the atrial pressure, because the atrial pressure is the pressure for the veins, okay? And the mean arterial pressure is the pressure for the arteries. So you have to add uh, the difference in pressure uh, so the difference in pressure, you can, again, I'm repeating myself, but just to hammer this home, uh, you multiply it by 0 0.78 for every single centimeter. So uh, you go down 103, uh, that's going to give you a difference of 80. You add that difference of 80 because this, because you have 80 milligrams mercury increase in pressure from the heart. Okay. So uh, I hope that makes sense. So, uh, this is uh, essentially the same thing, but a few added points that I thought were important that you put in the notes but the height of an individual will affect the changes in, in blood pressure above or below the heart. So obviously, any yani, if, uh, if the person is tall, then this vein or artery at the, at the foot is gonna be more than 103. It's gonna be 107, 110, something like this, you know? So the distance is gonna be more. So when you multi multiply by that by 0 0.78, you're gonna have a greater, um, a greater uh, increase or decrease in pressure, depending on if you go up or down. And the shorter the person is, it's the exact opposite. I mean, if the person is short, uh, you're going to have decreased distance, okay? Uh, that's all that this point uh, talks about. Blood will pull at lower end of the body. Uh, so, okay. Mechanisms such as muscle contraction and one-way valves oppose this pulling of blood, okay? So let's just skip ahead to uh, a few slides. So if you look here, so basically the veins, uh, they are uh, located uh, within or between skeletal muscles, okay? Or muscle fibers. So when the muscles contract, they're going to push the veins. So, you know, the veins, if you, if you imagine the veins and you, muscle, and, you, and you imagine the muscle pushing against them, uh, the blood will, will, you know, there's going to be an increase in pressure inside and the blood will want to leave. But then you have another thing called these uh, valves, venous valves. I think, come on, you guys took these in anatomy. But um, just as a quick review, Yanni, so they're one way. So when the muscle contracts over here, they can't go down this way because this valve doesn't open here. So the only way they can go is here. So they're forced to go up, right? So if you go back to this slide, yeah. So uh, these these two mechanisms they oppose the pooling of blood. So they don't allow the blood to pull downstairs uh, down in the downstairs. They don't allow it to pull it in the lower end of the valve. Okay. So if if these mechanisms, so the muscle contraction or the one-way valve, if they're compromised or they have some sort of a defect. It could lead to edema because you have, you know, the blood is going to stay down. For example, if the valves are not working, then there will be no one-way flow of the blood. So it's going to stay down uh, in the veins, which uh, will lead to edema. All right. Like, so this is a, um, uh, I think this was also uh, mentioned in a previous lecture, but we will go over this very quickly in context to this lecture. So uh, talking about bare receptors. One thing that uh, I would like to clarify is, um, it's come on, coming up in the next slide, but uh, the main barrier receptors that you have are in the carotid sinus. So right, uh, you know, right when the uh, carotid artery bifurcates, that's where you have them, as well as the aortic arch. So these two places are um, 
you know, they have an abundance of um, bear receptors. So what happens when the discharge decrease? Also, before we go further, I would like to just uh, clarify a small concept. Uh, so bear receptors, when you stretch them, their uh, firing is going to uh, increase. So they're going to send uh, increased uh, signals or increased action potentials, whichever way you want to think of it, to the brain or uh, more, uh, if you want to be precise, to the nucleus tractus solitaris. Okay. So that's when you stretch them. So when do they get stretched? When you have, you know, increased pressure. So increased pressure, increased blood, it's going to stretch them. That's going to increase their discharge. So when you don't have that increased pressure, when the pressure is low, you're going to have a decreased discharge. So they're going to send less action potentials or less signals to the brain or to the nervous system, okay? So when they send less signals, that's going to be processed here by the uh, nucleus tractus solitaris, which is uh, uh, it's the center for uh, processing uh, cardiovascular signals, okay? So what that is going to do is that is going to inhibit, so you can see there's two minus signs here. It's going to inhibit, this over here is the cardio inhibitory center or the parasympathetic center, okay? This is the sympathetic center. So the minus sign here does not indicate uh, inhibition of the, of the sympathetic. It means it's inhibiting uh, glutamate, GLU, and GABA. So glutamate and GABA, um, it's, you don't need to know this, but it's just to, um, I don't think you need to know this at least, but just to uh, tie it in with the concept. These are uh, uh, neurotransmitters which inhibit uh, neurons. They're inhibit, basically they have, a, they have, a, they have an uh, inhibitory effect, okay? So when you inhibit, the inhibitory neurotransmitters, you're going to activate the thing that they're inhibiting, which in case this in this case here is the sympathetic nervous system. Okay. So you remove the inhibition of the sympathetic nervous system. So you're going to have increase in sympathetic signaling, which is going to, you know, go to the heart, go to the blood vessels, which is going to increase contractility, going to increase um, uh, heart rate, going to increase uh, resistance in the vessels, uh, etc. Okay. At the same time, decreasing par uh, the, the the NTS is going to uh, decrease parasympathetic activity, so that the you know sympathetic activity is uh, unopposed. Okay. So here, this is the same thing: uh, stretching of bare receptors uh, cause them to increase signals, increase pressure, so they stretch. When you don't stretch because of low pressure, you'll have decreased signals. So the NTS processes the signals. And it's going to determine whether uh, you know the body should uh, increase or decrease the blood pressure. If it's elevated, it will want to decrease it by you know reducing heart rate and contractility. And if it's uh, decreased, then the body will want to increase it. Uh, you get the point. So, uh, so uh, almost every every single uh, artery or every main artery in the in the thoracic or uh, or in the upper body, you can say basically mostly in the thoracic region, um, have, you know, um, a few bare receptors, uh, you know, in, in the walls of the arteries. But uh, the main or the, the main area where you have bare receptors, there's the, those are the two here. So the carotid sinus and the aortic arch. Here is where you have the most uh, concentrated bare receptors. So this is the main point where uh, signaling, signaling to the nervous system goes through, okay? So the next concept is orthostatic hypertension. So also it's also called the postural hypertension, but uh, know both names because uh, this name is more common orthostatic hypertension. So this is basically um, this concept is basically you know when we mentioned in, in the first slide how when the bare receptors fail, it could lead to syncope or it could lead to uh, unconsciousness. Okay, so this is basically when you have a problem or a defect in the bare receptors, okay? So when you stand up, uh, the pressure in the head and upper body is going to fall because, you know, gravity pulls the blood to the lower body. Um, so if you have enough reduction in the pressure, it could lead to syncope or loss of consciousness. So normally the bare receptors sense the decrease in pressure and immediately they send a reflex back to the, the NTS, you know, uh, and they're like, you know, the signal that uh, the blood pressure is low and the NTS uh, signals to the heart and the blood vessels, uh, you know, a sympathetic signaling to increase the blood pressure. But if you have a defect in these bare receptors, then you could, uh, it could lead to orthostatic hypertension, which is basically when you stand up, when you're lying down, you suddenly stand up, uh, your body goes hypotensive for a few, uh, for a small amount of time, okay? Um, 
another um, another reason for uh, orthostatic hypotension could also be hypovolemia. So if you have loss of blood due to whatever reason, uh, hemorrhage or you know bleed, bleeding is hemorrhage, but uh, hemorrhage or loss of blood in the uh, loss of uh, fluid in the kidneys, uh, any sort of hypovolemia can also cause orthostatic hypertension because essentially you have less volume, which is going to cause less pr less pressure. So when you stand up, you already have when you're lying down, you already have lower pressure than usual. So when you stand up, it's going to be harder for the for the, for the nervous system to get it back up. So again, uh, uh, people could experience orthostatic hypertension. Okay, so uh, this is definition. It's the inability to restore blood pressure to normal with a change in body position, or uh, it's not exactly any, it, it could get restored, but you know, after a while, for example, if people stand up, they get dizzy or something like that. Some people might even faint if it's severe. So it depends on the severity. So there's this thing called the ta table test, uh, which is uh, used to uh, you know it's to check for orthostatic hypertension. So here are the results of the tilt table tests. So if you if you look over here, so this gives you the whole scenario basically from the start with what we've been saying that you have decreased stimulation due to decreased pressure. That is going to decrease vagal outflow to the heart. Uh, vagal is parasympathetic, uh, so you're going to have decreased parasympathetic, which makes sense, and you're going to have increased sympathetic. Uh, stimulation, which again should make sense. Okay, so stroke volume goes down, heart rate goes up, contractility goes up. Again, why? Because you have uh, because the sympathetic nervous system is uh, stimulating the heart to increase the heart rate and contraction. Why does stroke volume go down? Uh, that's going to uh, I've put that on the next slide. So uh, when we get to it, um, cardiac output declines by only twenty percent. So again, uh, the in a normal person, the bare receptors, uh, the, um, the bare receptor reflex, it makes up for, or it uh, automatically, uh, you know, um, gets the blood pressure back to normal. So there is a decline in cardiac output, but again, as you can see, it's it's not very significant if you can see on the graph. So it does decline, but only by twenty percent. So the resistance goes up, as you can see here, it goes up by a lot. If you look at the tilt table, the total peripheral resistance is shooting up. And uh, this is due to vasoconstriction, obviously. Uh, the mean arterial pressure, uh, it's also going to go up. Why? Because you're vasoconstricting, so the pressure should go up, right? Uh, okay, so this is, again, from the notes. So this is what happens when you don't have syncope. This is going to happen when you don't have the baroreceptor reflex or um, it's impaired or there's damage to it, some sort of damage. Okay, so uh, you'll have increased venous volume. So increased venous volume is going to be in the lower limbs, okay? You're going to have uh, decreased intrathoracic blood volume. So because the blood is staying in the lower limbs, there's not going to be enough blood in the thoracic cavity or in the veins in the thoracic cavity which is going to uh, lead to decrease of stroke volume. Why? Because you have decreased venous return. It's going to lead to decreased mean arterial pressure, which is going to lead to decreased brain perfusion or cerebral perfusion, which will lead to fainting. Obviously, this whole thing can be uh, avoided or is usually avoided because, uh, because of the bare receptors. So uh, again, any impairment in those um, will lead to syncope, all right? Okay, um, but moving to the next concept. Uh, so what happens if you keep standing motionless for a long period of time? Uh, here he mentioned it's uh, more than five minutes. So if you stand motionless for more than five minutes, uh, what would happen? It's, it's, uh, this chart is pretty simple to read. So uh, you're gonna have increased pressure in the lower extremities, uh, obviously because of gravity, you know, it keeps pulling the blood down. So if you stand motionless for five minutes, the thing about motionless is, okay, so you see these pumps that we mentioned earlier. So when you walk, the muscles are gonna contract, right? So when you're walking, uh, the, you're, gonna, you're gonna contract the muscles, which is gonna uh, you know, um, pump the blood technically uh, into the heart, okay? But so when, you're, when you're standing for a long time, or more than five minutes, as in this case he mentioned, so you're not walking. So there is no contraction of the muscles, so there is no pushing the veins to push the blood or no pressure on the blood to uh, get the blood back up to the heart, okay? So you're gonna have increased pressure 
Uh, when you have increased pressure, obviously you're going to have increased uh, pressure in the, in the capillaries. If you have increased pressure in the veins, that's going to cause uh, increased pressure in the capillaries, which is going to lead to increased filtration. So the fluid is going to leak from the circulation to the uh, extracellular fluid, extracellular matrix or fluid. Okay, you're gonna have increase in filtration, which is going to cause a loss of venous blood volume. So when you have a loss of venous blood volume, you're gonna have decreased central venous pressure. Again, central venous pressure, you can think of it mostly as uh, in the upper body. Uh, okay, so you can have decreased, uh, decreased venous pressure, especially in the thoracic cavity. Uh, but generally, generally you also, you're also gonna have decreased venous pressure because again, there is you know, less volume because the volume has been filtered out. It's gone to the, uh, it's gone to the extracellular spaces, okay? So when you have decreased venous pressure, you're gonna have decreased venous return. Again, venous return, if it's decreased, the cardiac output will decrease. You're gonna have decreased blood flow to the brain and it's gonna cause syncope. So um, one of these videos, uh, I think I, I opened one, uh, it was about, um, so the, the Royal Guards uh, in, in England. So, uh, you know, because they keep standing for a very long time, so some of them, you know, they uh, faint because, because of this, uh, because of this um, uh, phenomenon, because they are not walking, so there's no contraction of the muscles and the blood doesn't uh, go back up to the heart, okay? So this thing we've already explained before, when you, you know, when the muscles contract, when you're walking, running, etc., they contract, they push the veins, blood goes up to the heart. It can't go down because of the valves. The valves only open one way, so it goes. It only goes up in one direction, okay? Uh, all right. So, automatically, this will reduce venous volume and venous pressure. Why? Because, well, I mean, you're pushing the volume back into the heart, so veins are going to, you know, uh, have less volume, hence less pressure. Okay. So, another mechanism that reduces venous pooling is the thoracic muscle pump. Ali, you're going to, I think you're going to take this in more detail in, in the, after the midterm in the pulmonary section. But uh, basically, when you breathe, you create a, a negative pressure in the thoracic cavity because you won't, because you know, uh, this is a general concept. Everything moves from a uh, gradient of high pressure to low pressure. So if you, if you um, decrease the thoracic um, pressure lower than the atmospheric pressure, the, the air, along with the oxygen, will want to go inside, right? Because there will be a gradient. That's why you decrease the pressure inside the thoracic cavity, which, you know, uh, allows for uh, breathing, okay? So when you decrease pressure inside the thoracic cavity, you're also gonna have decreased pressure of the um, right atrium and the uh, central veins, right? So when you have decreased pressure of those, that's going to create a driving force because you have increased pressure in the peripheries because, you know, because gravity and blood is pulling down. So uh, blood again is going to move from an from an area of high pressure, which is in the lower body, to an area of uh, low pressure, which is in the thoracic cavity. Because uh, you know when you inhale, it's uh, it causes uh, it creates a, uh, a negative pressure in the thoracic cavity. So uh, that inhalation uh, causes negative pressure, which is uh, another mechanism, which is another mechanism that reduces uh, venous pooling in the lower extremities. So uh, I think these are the these are the main mechanisms, but uh, this is also uh, important for you guys to know. Um, uh, any problem with especially with these mechanisms will will cause edema, okay? Or it could cause edema. Um, right. So Tuman, when you increase pressure, you have increased uh, blood coming back up because you know it goes from high pressure to low pressure. It goes back. It goes into the heart. That increases venous return. That's going to increase cardiac output and you know bring everything back to normal. Okay, type. This is a concept map. It's I think everything that we discussed so far. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. We'll just go through it pretty quickly. So uh, when you stand up from a supine position or from laying down, because of gravity, you have the uh, blood pooling in the legs. That's going to cause uh, decreased uh, venous volume and decreased pressure. That's going to decrease venous return and decrease cardiac output and decrease arterial pressure. It's about the decrease in the Pressure is going to be sensed by the baroreceptors. Baroreceptors are going to go to the um, uh, NTS and uh, nucleus tractus solitaris, and uh, they are going to increase sympathetic and decrease parasympathetic. The same exact thing we talked about in, in this slide. Okay. Um, 
uh, sympathetic obviously is going to increase the contractility, heart rate, stroke volume, resistance. All of those combined are going to uh, increase the cardiac output. Cardiac output you know, inc it increases. It's going to go back and uh, you know uh, get the blood pressure back to normal. Uh, I think that's pretty simple. Okay, one more mechanism that uh, you know compensates for decreased uh, blood pressure is the renal compensation. So your kidneys, um, because blood flow to the kidneys, when you have decreased pressure, uh, the flow to the kidneys is also going to, you know, the arterioles in, that lead to the kidneys will also have decreased pressure. So the kidneys will sense this and uh, they're gonna activate the RAS system, the renal angiotensin aldosterone system. I think you guys took this in detail in uh, early lectures. So they're gonna activate that and uh, they will start to, um, you know, retain water. Um, so you increase the water in the body um, and that's gonna increase the, the blood volume, uh, which is going to uh, lead to, you know, which is going to bring the blood pressure back to normal. Uh, but the difference between uh, renal compensation and um, increasing the, the sympathetic stimulation is that uh, Renal compensation is a, a long-term uh, effect. So the, the immediate effect is of when you have hypovolemia or, or decreased blood pressure due to any reason, not necessarily hypovolemia. When you have decreased blood pressure, the immediate effect is the uh, sympathetic stimulation, okay? And decreased parasympathetic stimulation. Over long-term, uh, renal uh, compensation also uh, plays a role, okay? So again, this is the same thing. Uh, everything that we discussed, uh, you know, I have increased pressure in the lower extremities and in, uh, in the arteries and veins. Uh, that's going to cause decrease in central venous pressure because there's a shift from central to peripheral uh, circulation in the blood volume. So blood volume shifts from um, uh, central uh, or the, the bulk of the blood shifts from the uh, central circulation to the peripheral circulation. Um, uh, this is going to lead to decreased uh, venous return. Uh, oh, sorry, it's going to lead to decreased uh, venous central venous pressure, which will lead to eventually lead to decreased uh, venous return. Uh, lead to decreased stroke volume, which will lead to decreased cardiac output. Everything we decreased, decreased firing off bare receptors. Uh, that's going to you know go tell the brain that you know blood pressure is low. Brain's going to go tell the heart and the um, and the blood vessels uh, to constrict and the heart to contract, increase heart rate. Um, sympathetic activity will also go to the kidneys. Uh, again, it's more, uh, it's also sympathetic as well as the um, uh, kidneys themselves, they, they sense the, uh, the lower pressure of the blood, but it, uh, it's, it's termed under uh, sympathetic activity. Okay, so this is a long-term effect, which is the kidney fluid retention and the heart and the, and the uh, Blood vessel constriction is uh, the immediate effect, okay? All right, so this is uh, part two of this lecture or the second, uh, second half. So this, is, this is basically talking about the, uh, the effect of exercise on, you know, on cardiac output, blood pressure, etc. <laughs> okay, so intensity of aerobic exercise increases. Obviously, when you increase the intensity of exercise, your muscles will need more oxygen in order to be able to perform this intense exercise. So uh, there's two ways that uh, the muscles are going to get more oxygen. One of them is uh, very obvious, and I think uh, you're going to increase blood flow, to, uh, blood flow to the active muscle. Okay. The other is um, the active muscle extracts more oxygen from the blood. Uh, this is a concept which, uh, which he didn't really explain in the lecture, and I think that this has more to do with something that you will take uh, after the midterm, which is uh, the association and dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin. Maybe you took it in Molbus, I'm not sure. So uh, uh, the, um, the binding or the binding strength of oxygen or the affinity of oxygen to hemoglobin and uh, you know how it changes throughout. It's gonna be ex uh, explained in more detail in, in the pulmonary section. So, uh, the main focus, uh, he, he mainly focused on the first point for the rest of the lecture. So that's what we're gonna do. So blood flow increases, obviously how by increasing the cardiac output through, sim through simulation of the sympathetic nervous system. And um, another thing is that uh, vasodilation increases 
in the muscle that's um, that's exercising. So local vasodilation, local means localized to the muscle that's exercising, uh, to the active muscle or to yeah, active muscle is a better word. So okay, so why does this ha why does this happen? It's because of the uh, metabolic theory. So the uh, metabolic theory is basically um, when your muscles are going through you know exercise or doing something um, hard work anything, so they're using or consuming more oxygen than usual. When you consume more oxygen and at a faster rate than usual, uh, this is going to you know the result of this will be waste products, which will also be at a fast, which will also be produced at a faster rate. Okay. So these waste products like carbon dioxide and, uh, and you know, other metabolites, they will act on the, on the local um, blood vessels to cause vasodilation so that uh, blood can, you know, come in, uh, more blood can come in, bring in more oxygen, more nutrients, and more blood can leave taking, you know, taking out more carbon dioxide and other uh, waste products. Okay. So this is the same thing again from the notes section. So stroke volume reaches the maximum when cardiac output is only half max plate. This is something that's explained uh, later on in a graph, which uh, we will get to. But uh, can you just uh, keep it in mind that you know when cardiac output is um, reaches uh, half uh, is uh, reaches the half of its maximum capacity, uh, stroke volume reaches its maximum capacity. Stroke volume does not increase anymore. So the rest of the increase in cardiac output or the other half is due to increased heart rate, okay? So uh, after a certain point, the increase in cardiac output will be due to increased heart rate, not in stroke volume. Uh, we will discuss this in detail in, uh, in the coming slide, okay? So um, the elevation in stroke volume, uh, this is because of uh, two reasons, okay? So obviously one is going to be increased in contractility because you have sympathetic stimulation, Again, another thing that sympathetic stimulation will do is it's going to cause the, uh, you know, it's going to cause the veins to constrict, you know, how they're compliant, it's going to decrease their compliance. So when you decrease their compliance, it's going to constrict and push the blood to go back up to the heart, increasing means return. So increasing means return because of uh, decreased compliance. Uh, again, that's because of sympathetic activity. And increasing contractility are the two, uh, two reasons or the two uh, factors that uh, increase the stroke volume, okay, during exercise. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, also, sorry, one more thing. Uh, the increased muscle contraction also increases in, uh, in means return. So if you go, if you go back here to this slide, right? So when you're, uh, when you're walking, obviously you have contraction of muscles, but the more you increase in intensity, uh, the more your muscles are gonna contract. So the stronger, the, uh, the stronger they're going to push against the veins. So the more, in, the more intense your exercise, the more the means, the, the means return is going to increase, okay? So increased means return is due to two things. You have decreased means, means compliance and you have increased in, uh, in muscle contractions or the venous pumps in the lower extremities, okay? Or anywhere in the body in general, but since we talked about them in lower extremities, that's why I use them in the context. Uh, in the context. Context, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, again, just to uh, go over it again, to eliminate any confusions, increase in contractility and increase in means return. Increase in means return itself is due to two other um, factors, which is uh, compliance and uh, increased muscle contraction. Okay, these two factors are going to uh, increase the uh, short volume. Okay. So the cardiac cycle during exercise. So the cardiac cycle, obviously um, you're going to have increased heart rate. So when you increase the heart rate, the, the duration of the cardiac cycle is going to shorten. Okay, so it's it's going to take less time, basically. These are, I think are just numbers, uh, no need to really memorize them. Um, so uh, duration of systole and diastole is reduced, okay. Uh, but the main uh, the main portion that is reduced is the is the uh, diastole. Okay. So if you guys look at the graph over here, uh, you guys are the this highlighted portion. You can think of this as um, you know this is the part that gets uh, decreased during exercise. So uh, this this is also the time 
where you have the ventricular filling, okay? So if you decrease this portion, if you decrease this portion, it's going to uh, it's going to result in less ventricular filling. So it's there is not enough time for the ventricles to fill with with blood as they as they you know um, as they did uh, during regular you know when you're sitting or not exercising basically. So the um, the ventricular filling will be shortened. The time for ventricular filling will be shortened. So you're going to have less filling of the ventricles. Okay, so this is compensated by atrial contraction. So uh, the higher you increase in exercise intensity, the more important atrial contraction starts to become uh, in, to be able to maintain the end diastolic volume and the stroke volume. So if atrial contraction does not uh, you know, step up uh, during exercise, you're going to have uh, reduced ventricular filling, which will lead to reduced uh, end diastolic volume because, you know, uh, Blood is not filling, not enough blood is filling the ventricles, and that's going to lead to a decrease in stroke volume. Okay. Um, ventricular and aortic systolic pressures increase. That should uh, make sense. And um, cardiac output is a balance between uh, heart rate and uh, stroke volume. So, you know, I think you guys know the equation. So, stroke volume into heart rate gives you cardiac output. So, when you're increasing both, that's obviously going to be increasing cardiac output. Okay. That's what he, um, he means by this point. Uh, again, this we mentioned that very high heart rates, the uh, systolic and diastolic phase is shortened and stroke volume will be decreased because again, ventricles are not being given enough time to be able to fill properly, okay? So this is the same thing he mentioned in the notes. I just uh, put some main points. So when the heart increases, the period, decre period of cardiac cycle decreases, um, there is a greater reduction in diastole and systole. So, this is why uh, you have a reduced ventricular filling because diastole is more affected than systole is, okay? So at, uh, so, okay, so moderate changes in the heart rate. So when you're like doing some light exercise or maybe just walking, that's not going to affect the cardiac filling much, okay? So the heart rate, if, uh, if you have uh, slight changes in the heart rate, that is not gonna significantly affect the cardiac filling, okay? But if you start increasing the intensity of your exercise, then you will have to reach a point or you're, you're going to start having decreased ventricular filling because you're going to be shortening this period. Okay. That's when you need the, the atria to, to contract and, you know, push the, push the blood into the ventricle. So the, the atrial contraction becomes important, more important than usual. Uh, again, this is just a number at high heart rates, 40% of the stroke volume or 40% of the end diastolic volume uh enters the ventricles because of atrial contraction so if you don't have the atrial contraction you're going to have uh, a, a very low uh, amount of um and diastolic volume and stroke volume which is definitely not good especially when you're exercising because you know you want the blood to go to the muscles okay like so uh effective sympathetic stimulation uh, again this is essentially the same concept, but uh, this is focusing more on the left ventricular pressure, okay? So uh, if you look at the graph here on the y-axis, you have the uh, left ventricular pressure and on the x-axis, you have the uh, time. Okay, so if so, here it gives you the, um, it, gives, it gives you the key for the graph. So A is control, which is the blue one. So if you look at, um, uh, B is hyperdynamic, so you have increased sympathetic stimulation. C is hypodynamic, so you have decreased sympathetic or increased parasympathetic, whichever way you want to look at it. So if you compare C to A, you'll see that left ventricular pressure is slower to rise, and it rises lower than uh, at normal, which is A, okay? And if you look at uh, B, which is hyperdynamic, so you have increased sympathetic stimulation, see, so you can see it rises faster than A, and it rises to a higher um, value than A, okay? So, um, uh, so you have the uh, development of uh, pressure uh, over, develop, over the development of time is going to uh, increase uh, as, you, um, as you increase the strength of the contraction, okay? 
so if you and you can compare B to C to see uh, uh, you know it's it's easier to compare or it's more effective uh, to compare B to C. Uh, so you can see the difference uh, between uh, increased sympathetic stimulation and decreased sympathetic stimulation. Uh, one point to know here is the uh, rate of ventricular relaxation is greater. So uh, positive leucotropic effect. So the leucotropic effect is basically uh, the uh, relaxation of the ventricles. So positive means it's faster and negative means it's slower. So positive leucotropic effect, you have faster ventricular relaxation. Uh, again, we mentioned this point over here. So relaxation is the same thing as diastole. So that's shortened. That's the, uh, that diastole has a greater reduction than systole. Okay, so yeah. Uh, this was the graph that I mentioned earlier, and I told you that uh, you know when you reach uh, half or uh, half of the maximum potential that the heart rate can go, or that the cardiac output can go, uh, stroke volume is already maxed out. Okay, so if you look at this graph over here, um, on this side you have the stroke volume, on this side you have the heart rate, and x-axis is showing you the cardiac output. Okay, so if you um, look at the stroke volume it starts to increase, okay? But then over here, it, uh, you know, it stops increasing. So at around, uh, let's say 13 maybe here. So at 13, when cardiac output reaches 13 liters per minute, stroke volume is going to uh, stop increasing. But heart rate, uh, cardiac output can still go up to all these, you know, can go to this level, right? So, the major factor that will allow the cardiac output to go higher than this point where the stroke volume uh, stops increasing is the heart rate, okay? So after a certain point, the, the heart rate will be the, the main thing that, uh, or the main factor that allows the cardiac output to increase, okay? So the elevation in stroke volume, this uh, comes from, again, uh, we mentioned this earlier, this is uh, because of increased venous return, uh, causes increased preload. So you have, you know, when you have increased preload, you're going to have increased stroke, uh, you're going to increase stroke volume. Okay. Uh, you're going to have increased uh, contractility, um, which is uh, caused by the sympathetic uh, nervous system, causes reduced end systolic volumes here, pushing more blood out of the heart than usual. Okay. Or, or out of the ventricle than usual. The elevation in heart rate comes from uh, increase sympathetic and decrease parasympathetic. We've mentioned that before. Um, uh, at very high heart rates, stroke volume begins to reduce due to reduced filling time. Again, we've mentioned the same concept before. So uh, if you go back here, filling time gets reduced. So you're going to have um, decreased uh, stroke volume. However, the heart rate can, 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 can keep on increasing which is going to increase the cardiac output, okay? This is the same thing uh, which I took from his notes, uh, just to summarize points. So at the initial, so at the, at the initial phases, you have, uh, uh, you have increase of stroke volume. It goes faster than the heart rate again. Why? Because of uh, increased venous return and increased contractility. However, it reaches a peak and then uh, it's the heart rate that continues to you know, uh, increase. So cardiac output higher than uh, a certain certain amount. Uh, I think he mentioned 15 in the notes. Uh, so higher than a certain amount is achieved mainly by increasing the heart rate and not the stroke volume because the stroke volume has maxed out. Okay, it can't go anymore. Why is that? Because uh, the time for ventricular filling is too short. Okay. Right. So this chart, it's basically a uh, uh, chart, I think, um, uh, the main points that he mentioned in the notes from this chart uh, are here. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that you notice is that athletes have a much lower resting heart rate than uh, average people. So this is due to, uh, okay, we'll get to this later. We'll get to why it is the way it is. Um, okay, so stroke volume increases with, with, uh, with exercise intensity. Um, this is again, um, it's, uh, I think it's easy to understand that, you know, when you increase exercise intensity, you're going to want to increase stroke volume. Um, maximum heart rate, resting stroke volume, as you can see, it increases from 60 to 120 when you exercise and average people. Uh, in uh, athletes, stroke volume is 
already increased because well their heart is conditioned you know because they, uh, they exercise every day so their heart is used to it it's stronger and more um healthier than the it's healthier than the uh, average uh, the heart of the average person that's why you have increased stroke volume and obviously during exercise it increases even more okay so uh, okay so the increase in stroke volume again uh, so there's two things that um that um uh, govern the increase in stroke volume or that uh, that are the cause for increase in stroke volume. So one obviously is you have increased venous return. So you have increased venous return. That's going to, you know, you have more blood coming into the heart. That's going to cause more blood to leave the heart. Uh, that makes sense. But the other thing is that because you have increased venous return, so you have um, more blood coming into the heart, the heart will stretch more. When it stretches more, it's going to have more elastic recoil. So the contraction is going to be stronger. So that's going to increase stroke volume as, uh, as well. So there's two things that uh, are increasing stroke volume. One is, uh, in, uh, one is increased venous return. Okay, and the other is the increased elastic recoil due to the increased venous return. So both these things are going to be, uh, are going to uh, cause um, increase in stroke volume, okay? So uh, cardiac output, obviously, when you're increasing stroke volume and heart rate, so well, when you multiply those, that gives you the cardiac output. So when both are getting increased, and then you multiply them, that's going to increase the cardiac output. Okay, that should make sense. Right, so aerobic conditioning. So this is, uh, well, it's, it's a fancy way of saying, you know, when you exercise a lot, uh, your heart gets conditioned and gets stronger. So... Um, okay, so three points or three things that uh, that aerobic conditioning does to your heart. So number one, it reduces the resting heart rate, which we saw over here. So athletes have a lower heart rate than average people. Um, so this is due primarily, primarily to an increase in resting vagal tone. Why is there an increase in resting vagal tone? Uh, this is because the second point, so you have enlargement of the ventricles, physiological hypertrophy. So because uh, ventricles are like any muscle, when you work them, they're going to, you know, become stronger. So it's, uh, it's the same as with, with, uh, with like uh, other muscles in the body. When you, when you work out, they become stronger. It's, it's the same concept. So the heart is a muscle. Uh, when you work it out every day, it's going to get stronger. So there's going to be physiological hypertrophy. And because of the physiological hypertrophy and the ventricles are stronger, you're going to have an increase in stroke volume because the contractions are going to be uh, stronger, okay? So when the contractions are going to be stronger, you're going to have increased stroke volume. So when you have increased uh, uh, stroke volume um, from the, uh, because of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, condition, increased conditioning of the heart, you know, the, the nervous system is gonna be, you know, they're, it's going to think that um, the stroke volume or the blood coming out of the heart, because of a single, because of uh, contractions uh, at a lower rate, is enough to supply the body while resting. Because the heart is, because the heart, you know, it's essentially because it's it's strong enough to do that. So the heart in a, an athlete is strong enough to uh, supply uh, uh, the body with oxygen normally at 33 beats per minute. So because of that, there, there is going to be a decrease, there is going to be a decrease in vagal tone, decrease in parasympathetic activity, which will, um, which will lead to a decreased heart rate. Okay, so these two points are kind of interconnected. Uh, I hope it makes sense, okay? So the last thing is that it's gonna stimulate angiogenesis. So you're gonna have increased formation of blood vessels uh, in the skeletal muscle and in the cardiac muscle. Okay, so whichever skeletal muscle is exercising, that's going to have uh, formation of more blood vessels so that you can have more blood delivery to the muscle to, you know, increase um, nutrient, uh, uh, you know, increase nutrients going to the muscle and increase uh, waste products leaving the muscle, okay? Uh, one point that he mentioned in the, in the note section that, uh, that isn't covered in the previous slide, so the limiting system in terms of maximum aerobic capacity. So the the maximum the maximum the, the maximum aerobic capacity for the muscles 
What limits it is the cardiovascular system, not the exchange of gases in the lung. Okay, so the exchange of gases in the lung is enough uh, for, um, it's enough, it's, it, it provides enough oxygen and removes enough carbon dioxide um, that is needed to reach maximum aerobic capacity for, uh, for our, that is needed for our muscles to reach uh, maximum uh, aerobic capacity, okay? But the cardiovascular system, it's any, it reaches a maximum and then it can't, any, it can't go more than that. So uh, what limits the, the, the aerobic capacity of the, uh, of the muscles is the cardiovascular system and not the exchange of oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide in the alveoli. I think you guys are gonna take this command in more detail in the next block, but uh, just know that the limiting system in terms of maximum aerobic capacity is the cardiovascular system. So it reaches a maximum, then it can't, it can't go more than that, okay? So this is true in both unconditioned and conditioned individuals. Um, okay, exercise induced changes in cardiac output. So, okay, you increase physical activity, you're doing exercise, okay? That's going to have a local effect and that's going to have a sympathetic nervous system effect, okay? Um, so the sympathetic nervous system effect, you're gonna have increased um, stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. That is going to increase cardiac output and uh, constriction of the vessels. Uh, increased cardiac output will lead to increased uh, arterial pressure, increased systemic vasoconstriction will lead to increased uh, resistance, okay? So um, the local effect is going to be uh, again, it's the metabolite effect. So the carbon dioxide and the waste products and other metabolites that the muscle releases, the, the exercising muscle releases as waste, um, they are going to, um, they're going to, sorry, they're going to affect the, um, the vessels in the local or in the active muscle, uh, and they're gonna cause them to vasodilate. So when they vasodilate, uh, massive vasodilation, so I mean, there is going to be, a whole lot of vasodilation, which will cause, which will reduce the total peripheral resistance any greatly, okay? So even though uh, you have a sympathetic effect that is increasing the resistance, the vasodilation in the active muscle, the effect of the vasodilation in the active muscle is, is way more than the effect of the sympathetic nervous system on the resistance, okay? So as you can see, three errors here and one error over here. So the overall effect is going to be a reduction in the resistance. So you're going to have reduced uh, resistance so that, you know, blood can flow to the muscle easily. I mean, that should make sense to you, okay? Um, right. So uh, this vasodilation that we mentioned over here due to the, uh, sorry, this vasoconstriction that we mentioned over here uh, due to the sympathetic nervous system, what it's going to do is it's also going to, this is going to be a generalized vasoconstriction, okay? So what it's going to do is, it's going to uh, constrict the vessels going to the GI tract and the kidneys, okay? So uh, other vascular beds such as the kidneys and GI tract. Uh, and uh, you have vasodilation from the metabolites in the active muscle, okay? So vasodilation in the active muscle and vasoconstriction to other unnecessary areas uh, where you don't want the blood flow to, where you don't want the blood to go uh, at the time when you're exercising. So you want the blood flow to be directed at the muscles. Okay. So because of the vasoconstriction, uh, vasoconstriction uh, at the GI tract and the kidneys and you know other uh, other stuff that are uh, not necessary at the moment, and the vasodilation of the, and the vasodilation of the muscles or the skeletal muscles, uh, that's going to um, direct the blood flow uh, towards the muscle so that they can get the uh, oxygen and nutrients that are needed. Uh, obviously, again, like we said, it's uh, mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, which is gonna cause the vasoconstriction, which is gonna you know, direct the blood flow to go to the uh, muscle where you have vasodilation so the blood can flow there easily. Okay. All right, so, um, uh, because, uh, so basically uh, a large portion of, well, in, when you're not exercising in, in a normal state, um, the, uh, the, uh, most of the arterial resistance 
is in the skeletal muscle. So when you have vasodilation there during exercise, that is going to uh, mostly compensate for the elevation in cardiac output, which we see over here due to the sympathetic nervous system. So the so this vasodilation is going to uh, compensate for this cardiac output, uh, for this, uh, sorry, for this, um, uh, yes, for this increased cardiac output. Let's, do that. Let's uh, do that again, okay? So this vasodilation, which is caused by the metabolic effect of the, of, of the waste products, is going to counteract the, the increased cardiac output, which is due to the sympathetic nervous system, okay? So because it counteracts the cardiac output, there is not going to be a great, uh, there is not going to be a, uh, a significant amount of change in, in the blood pressure during, in the cardiac up during exercise. So it's gonna go up by like 15 to 30, uh, uh, the, the arterial pressure is going to go up by 15 to 30 millimeters mercury, uh, but it's not gonna go up by a lot because uh, the vasodilation in, in, the, in the muscles uh, counteract the increased cardiac output and the increased uh, arterial pressure, okay? All right, so, Right, so what, what changes happen in the uh, PV loop? So if you compare the uh, exercise PV loop to uh, a regular PV loop, so the end diastolic volume, which is over here in the, in the, control, uh, the control loop or in the normal loop, uh, that's going to be increased. Uh, why? Because you have a decreased venous compliance, so you have increased venous return, more blood coming to the heart, that's going to increase the end diastolic volume, which is uh, over here, okay? And uh, you're gonna have increase in systolic blood pressure, okay? Why? Because you're gonna have increase in contractility. So when you, well, if you contract your hand, okay? If you do it with less force, that's going to create less pressure. But if I do it with more force, that's gonna create more pressure, it's same with the heart. So when you contract the heart, with uh, a stronger contractility, that's going to generate more pressure. So as you can see, the pressure uh, goes, you know, um, higher than at normal, okay? Uh, for the ESPVR line, it's, um, it's mentioned, uh, I'll, explain, I'll explain this in the next slide. Uh, it's not very significant, but uh, just to, you know, um, cover it, I'll just mention to you what it is uh, and uh, how it, um, how it changes. So it basically here he says it becomes steeper. So this is the ESPVR line. Okay. So let's say if this is the normal curve, this is the normal PV loop, and the uh, cardiac PV loop. Uh, sorry, the the, ex the PV loop during exercise um, is going this way, right? Something like this. So the line is going to be steeper over here. If you look at it over here, it's the same thing. So line here is uh, on the control is uh, less steep than the exercise. So the exercise, so on the exercise loop, the line is cheaper. That, that's all I think that you guys, that you need to know about this. So during exercise, it becomes steeper. Uh, the end systolic volume, which is uh, somewhere around uh, here in the uh, normal, um, normal loop and in the exercise loop, it's somewhere around here. So obviously you can see um, that it decreases. If you look at the volume here, it's around 50. And if this goes down, this is you know a bit less than the uh, it's uh, less than the control uh, control PV loop. The um, systolic volume is uh, going to um, sorry the the stroke volume is going to increase. The stroke volume is going to increase. Okay, uh, and the heart rate and cardiac output are also going to increase. That's all stuff that we covered uh, in the previous slides. Uh, again, obviously, all this is due to the sympathetic stimulation. But the stroke work, which is the area of the PV loop, uh, so the whole area is basically going to be increased, okay? So, um, again, you're going to have uh, increased end diastolic volume. You're going to have increased uh, uh, systolic blood pressure. So when the ventricle is contracting, you're going to have increased pressure. Um, you're going to have decreased end systolic volume because, uh, why? Because... Uh, you know, you're, you're pushing more blood out of the ventricle because of the increased contractility. Um, 
and you're going to have increased stroke volume again because of the increased contractility and increased heart rate and cardiac output and just a bigger stroke work or a bigger area of the pain. Okay, all right. So uh, we mentioned this. Okay, so we mentioned uh, here that um, the uh, mean arterial pressure it increases, but only by 15 to 30 uh, millimeters during exercise. Why was this again? It was because the vasoconstriction, uh, sorry, the vasodilation in the, in the active muscle uh, counteracts the increased cardiac output and the increased mean arterial pressure, okay? But however, there is a slight increase in the mean arterial pressure. So why is this not counteracted by the uh, barrier receptor reflex that we mentioned uh, earlier? Well, I mean, um, this is because, um, uh, this is because uh, the set point for the bare receptors or the threshold uh, gets reset. So uh, the bare receptors find a new normal. So let's say um, for a regular person, the bare receptors uh, think that a normal heart rate is um, nor normal average is uh, 100. Okay. So during exercise, that is going to get reset to let's say 110 or 100. 20, or, you know, th these are just random numbers, but you, know, you get the idea. So that's going to, it's going to think that the new normal during exercise is 110. So 110 will be normal for the receptor. So they're not going to, there's not going to be a change in their firing or in, in their sending signals to the uh, nervous system. Okay. But, um, right. So, uh, where were we? Okay, yeah. So this uh, resetting this happens in two uh, in two um, in two situations or the two that he mentioned. This can happen in exercise and in chronic hypertension. Okay. So um, during chronic hypertension, it's going to be the same thing, but this is going to be pathological. So the uh, bare receptors are, are going to be set at a new normal, which is higher than the average. Or which is higher than the regular normal for like you know usual people, uh, but it's not going to be reversible because exercise. The, once you finish the exercise, the bare receptors come back down to normal. Okay, so if this the, this uh, dotted line is the exercise line, okay, so after the exercise, it's going to shift back to the normal line. All right, but during chronic hypertension, uh, it's not going to shift back. So because of a pathology. The bare receptors are going to the, the bare receptors are going to stay set uh, at this um, at this uh, set point or at this uh, threshold. Okay. Um, right. So this is the same thing with the previous slide I was talking about. So one thing that the control mechanisms discussed previously are effective at controlling uh, pressure changes over short term. So for example, from supine to standing up. So the bare receptor reflex is good at controlling um, uh, when you, you know, when you're lying down and you stand up, it's good at uh, uh, not allowing the blood to pool in the lower extremities. But when you're exercising, that's a, that's, you know, that's a, a long-term change. So the pressure is going to stay high for a long time. That's when, so because the pressure is staying high for a long time, it's going to reset. Okay. The same thing with chronic hypertension. So because the blood pressure is, uh, the, so the chronic hypertension is the same thing. So the, like we mentioned here, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to be resetted. But again, the chronic hypertension is not going to be reversible while exercise is reversible. Um, okay, so um, this resetting of the baroreceptor reflex is controlled by the, by the higher regions of the brain and the afferent nerves from the active muscle. So the muscle that's exercising, it's going to send the afferent signals to the nervous system. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna tell, them, tell the nervous system that, you know, I'm exercising and uh, you might need to uh, increase the threshold for the bare receptors, okay? So that's why the nervous system is going to, that's gonna go to the high region of the brain, it's gonna process it, it's gonna go back to the bare receptors and it's gonna reset the threshold to a higher level. So the extent of resetting is proportional to the work intensity. Okay, so obviously the the more the the, the more intense or the more um, the higher intensity of your workout, um, the higher uh, 
you're going to have the resetting of the bare receptors. So let's say if this dotted line over here, this is at a light uh, exercise, like say jogging or someone's, uh, you know, doing something or walking for some people. So when you, um, when you increase the intensity, when you start running or like start sprinting, uh, the, the bare receptors are going to be reset to a higher level over here. So they're going to be reset to, um, so any, as you increase the intensity, you're, you're, you're going to be increasing the, uh, the threshold or, the, or what the bare receptors think is the normal pressure, okay? Uh, play. This allows the mean arterial pressure to, to rise in line with the exercise intensity um, without, evo uh, without uh, evoking a, a reflex inhibition of the heart rate. So again, um, because they uh, increase simultaneously, so they go up together. So uh, intensity increases, the, uh, the resetting of the mirror receptor increases. So if it didn't, then obviously you would have a... You, you, you would have the bare receptor reflex, which would go and uh, decrease the heart rate, decrease the um, contractility, and you know the, the muscles wouldn't be able to get the nutrients that they need. Okay, so this is a concept map. At the end, uh, I think these these all these concepts uh, uh, have been mentioned before in the previous slide. Um, so when you begin exercising, you have. A local response in the active muscle and you have a nervous system response so nervous system response obviously going to decrease the parasympathetic nervous system uh, the parasympathetic nervous system um, stimulation and increase the sympathetic stimulation uh, sympath <coughs> sympathetic stimulation is going to um, increase the contractility it's going to increase the heart rate it's going to increase the uh, venous compliance the arterial resistance uh so all of that together is going to you know uh, lead to an increase in cardiac output uh also the local response you're going to have increased muscle activity that's going to increase metabolite and waste product and waste uh, production uh again the same metabolic theory it's going to call local it's going to cause local vasodilation that's going to cause increased resistance when you have increased uh, decreased resistance when you have increased resistance due to the sympathetic nervous system but because you have a huge amount of vasodilation in the active muscle, that's going to more than compensate for the increased resistance due to the um, sympathetic stimulation. And the overall effect is going to be decreased uh, total peripheral resistance. Okay. And I'll talk about increasing, uh, increasing uh, the dilation um, will cause, uh, which will cause decreased res resistance, will also increase the blood flow to the muscle. So it can take in more oxygen. It can bring in more oxygen and take out the uh, waste product. Um, okay. So these are the notes that he mentioned in the, that he put in the concept map slide. Um, uh, I think one thing that he mentioned was the alpha-1 receptors are located on the blood vessels, on the veins and, and arteries. So sympathetic stimulation is going to, um, that's going to cause uh, uh, catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine to bind to alpha one, and it's going to cause uh, you know it's going to cause them to constrict means compliance, going to cause increased means return, increased preload. Uh, when you constrict the the arterioles, that's going to cause increased their resistance, uh, etc. Uh, the M one and B one receptors are on the heart. I think that's all you need to know about those. They're in the heart, and they. Um, Sorry, the M2 and B1. So the M2 is on the heart and uh, it's a parasympathetic receptor and um, B1 is uh, also on the heart, but it's, it's sympathetic. I think that's all you need to know. No need to go into more detail. Uh, he didn't mention them in the, in the notes, but he did mention the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. So just, uh, I think just know that, you know, those are located on the blood vessels and they uh, cause uh, constriction when you have a sympathetic stimulation. Uh, okay, so a couple of questions. So you guys can pause the pause the video and uh, read and try to answer it. Okay. Uh, play. So the answer is B. And I hope you guys got it, Yanni. If you didn't, then uh, let me think of it this way. So when you're uh, the medical student is uh, constricting the carotid artery, okay? And we mentioned 
that the bare receptors are located at the bifurcation of the keratin. So when you uh, constrict it before the bifurcation, you're going to have decrease of blood flow uh, to the bare receptors. So they're going to sense a lower blood pressure. Okay. So which is why you're going to have uh, increased sympathetic activity because you know the bare receptor sends lower pressure, and you're going to have a decrease in renal flow. Why would you have a decrease in renal flow? Well, because uh, uh, the sympathetic activity is going to cause the uh, arterioles to constrict. So when they constrict, uh, the, the arterioles leading to the, the kidneys are also going to be constricted. That's going to cause decreased uh, renal blood flow. And that, uh, when you constrict the arterioles due to sympathetic nerve activity, that's going to increase the total uh, peripheral resistance. OK, you guys can also read the ex explanation. Um, so next question, same thing. You guys can pause the screen and try to answer this. Um, okay. So uh, uh, the answer is uh, E. Um, tell you guys got it right, Jenny. If you didn't, then um, uh, basically, uh, she. What is the what is the the person doing? She's exercising it's an exercise test so she's exercising and then they're going to test for these things so what would increase during exercise so vascular conductance um in this uh, okay what would increase in the skeletal muscle during exercise so uh, like we mentioned when you're exercising the the muscles the skeletal muscles you're going to have an increased production of um waste products like carbon dioxide and you know other metabolites uh, so they go to the local uh, veins in the active muscle and they cause vasodilation. So when you vasodilate, you're going to have increased conductance of the, of the circulation. So you, you, it can conduct more blood. Okay, obviously you're going to have more blood flow. More carbon dioxide concentration. Why? Because again, the muscle is, uh, you know, it's contracting, it's using up the oxygen. So when you use the oxygen, it's going to release carbon dioxide as a waste product. Uh, arterial diameter, uh, arter arteriolar diameter, it's because of, um, yeah, it's because of the, of the vasoconstriction. Uh, so again, all of these things are increasing. So the, the, the obvious answer is, uh, is, is E, all of the above. Again, you guys can read the explanation. It should make sense to you. Okay, um, that's it for this lecture. Um, uh, I think the, the midterm is, in two days, I think one day, come on. So it's after tomorrow. If, um, inshallah, it goes well, Yanni. I hope it's going to be easy. And uh, you guys, I hope you guys, you know, um, you, you all get uh, good grades and uh, inshallah, be more motivated for the, for the final, inshallah. If you guys have any questions, you guys can email me or text me and inshallah, I'll answer them as best I can, okay? Uh, thank you very much and uh, good luck.